Our study of St. Mark's Gospel continues today in chapter 12. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing, and he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even her living. All in all, it had been a long and stormy day in the temple of old Jerusalem. The religious leaders had Jesus on their turf, or so they figured, and they tried everything they could think of to trip him up, to embarrass him, to intimidate him, and they couldn't do it. But his parting shot was not to them, but to the common people. Please, you are not spectators to all of this. You are participants. And you watch out for those religious leaders of yours. Beware of the scribes who love to walk around in flowing robes and be recognized in the marketplaces, have the most honorable places in the synagogue and the best seats at banquets. But you know that. It's always ugly. When the proud, self-important person places himself in the place of God. But then, he said something much worse. They devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. And they shall receive greater damnation. The word widow means desolate, bereft. Not every widow falls into that category, but every woman who has lost her life's companion knows something about the estrangement and the abandonment that it brings with it, psychologically as well as socially. And in a culture without social security or pension plan, without welfare or workman's compensation, a widow was left to the mercy of the society in which she lived. And I don't have to tell you how much mercy you're going to find out there in the society in which you live. But if you read your Bible at all, you know that God identifies himself with her. I am the God of the widow and the fatherless children. The words appear over and over with monotonous regularity. You plead the case of the widow and the orphan. You defend the poor and the oppressed and the stranger within thy gate. The law of Moses set aside for them the tithe of every third year the forgotten sheep in the field was reserved for them. The gleanings in the orchards and the vineyards were there. Think of the grand Old Testament stories that you remember. The widow of Seraphat, who shared her last meal with the prophet Elijah. The lovely woman Ruth, herself a widow, who tried to take care of her embittered and widowed mother-in-law. Well, in the gospel, Jesus stops that funeral procession in far off land because his heart went out to a woman who had just lost her only son and she was a widow. He taught us how to pray in the parable of the widow in the courtroom of an unjust judge. Even in the drawn-out agony of Calvary, 
when he was passing through water so deep and swift and dark, you can't even imagine this. Jesus remembered his widowed mother and provided for her care. St. Paul has an entire chapter in an epistle on this subject. Who the widows really are and how they are to be honored. James, in his blunt way, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the widow and the fatherless in their affliction. Against that background, you can see what a damning indictment it was when Jesus says they devour widows' houses, posing as administrators and financial counselors to devour, to consume, be gobble up beyond any conceivable need, the estate of those who could least defend themselves. Any church, any school, any organization that discriminates against the poor, oh, may be very respectable, may be very successful, but the one thing it ain't ever going to be is Christian. Well, the storm blew over for a moment. The religious leaders retreated somewhere. And Jesus is now sitting on the steps leading down to the spacious treasury room of the temple. Against the far wall were 13 receptacles into which the people placed their offerings. But... The mouth, the opening, was shaped like the horn of a trumpet and made of brass. And since the Hebrews had no paper currency, it was metal on metal. Bing, ting, clang as the coin fell in. Well, it must have been quite a scene. We are told that the rich cast in much. The Jews were never stingy when it came to their own temple, the focal point of their national pride. A few years ago, during the Six-Day War against Egypt, Israeli supporters in this country gave a million dollars a minute. And that ain't, hey, maybe Jesus was referring to this when he said, when you give your gift to the poor, do not sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do to be seen of men. Well, <laughs> you toss in a big bag of coins into one of those metal trumpets, bang, bang, clang, clang. People would stop and turn around. Oohs and ahs would be elicited from the crowd. And murmurings of, oh God bless you, sir. But Jesus' eyes were keen. His ears were attuned to what no one else saw or heard. A solitary figure entered the room. Her black veil, her armband, identified her as a widow. Her worn and threadbare clothing, evidence of her poverty. She approached one of the offering boxes and dropped into it two mice. Copper coin, the smallest currency that was in use. Some say that the wealthy curled a sneering lip to the poor woman and her measly gift. I don't think so. Rich people don't even notice the poor. They know them as if they didn't even exist. Nobody, I'm sure, noticed anything. Remarkable or outstanding. Nobody that is except Jesus. He called the twelve together as he did only when some crisis had come up or only when there was something important they had to pick up on. He pointed to the figure leaving the sanctuary and said, I'm telling you the truth. That woman threw in more than everybody else. 
What? How can that be? How could her measly gift compare to the wealthy offerings of the other? Well, 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 well. What do you think? God measures stuff the way you do it. God's discerning eye sees not only the gift, <laughs> but the giver. Not only what is offered, but what is withheld. And so Jesus explains it. They all gave out of their abundance, their surplus. But she gave out of her poverty all that she had, even her own living. Now the questions come. <laughs> Didn't a woman know that the church clergy were wolves in sheep's clothing, that they're going to misuse her gift? Wasn't she appalled by those crass money changers sitting out there in the entryway and the stench of manure coming from the animal cages? Didn't she know that a couple of pennies for the crying out loud don't count for a darn thing? That's proved, by the way, that Americans, the average one, will not stop and pick up small change from the floor of a shopping mall. Why didn't she save at least one of the coins for her next meal? Set one of them aside for a rainy day. Yes, yes, yes. And when we're done saying all that, I know that the two copper coins are still in our pocket. Of course she did. She was a widow. She wasn't deaf, dumb, and blind. That was still her father's house. It wasn't there. She wasn't giving a gift to them. She was giving it to God. But why that commitment of everything? What transpired in her life? What inspired her to such sacrifice so that Jesus compared her two copper coins to pure gold? She doesn't say Jesus doesn't say. It's none of your business. All the important transactions in life are private. Between you and God. Your spirit and his spirit. That's why Jesus said, when you give your gifts to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. That's why it's always such a put-down of God's people to badger them and browbeat them into giving to, to uh, bribe them with all kinds of giving. You get this, you get that. And psychological ploys that harp on the strings of their shame or their guilt or their pride or their patriotism. You can't stop the faithful from giving. You can't stop them even if you try. And just because they don't tell you what they're doing doesn't mean that they aren't doing it. But wasn't she now totally poor. And wasn't she frightened now that her last penny was gone? Frightened by what? Commending yourself entirely into the keeping of your Heavenly Father. Casting all of your care upon Him who cares for you. Oh no, you want to be frightened. You take up that life of yours into your own hands. Or entrust it into somebody else's hands for safekeeping. Now that's frightening. Jesus identified with the total commitment of this woman who gave her all because that's what he did. All that he was, all that he had, holding back nothing, trusting that, and I can't prove this, but trusting that God would bless her. See, that's what you really want. You think you want more. You think you want different. No, you don't. What you want is God to bless you where you are and with what you have. See, and God can do it. God can bless anything. 
the humblest dwelling, the meagerest meal, the direst circumstance. God blessed the widow of Zarephath, whose cruise of oil never ran empty for three and a half years of famine. God blessed Ruth out there gleaning in the fields of Bethlehem, for there she found her Redeemer. God blessed the empty nets of the fishermen, he blessed the tears of the woman who anointed his feet with perfume. Well, God blessed the wooden beams of the cross and brought out of them for you pardon and peace and with those pierced hands of his still holds open for you and you and me the door to paradise. Amen.